Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to today's online discussion and Q&A, the coronavirus pandemic, capitalism, socialism, and the struggle against the Johnson government. A special welcome to those guests who I can see are joining us internationally from Australia and from the United States as well. My name is Tom Scripps. I'm a member of the Socialist Equality Party and a writer for the World Socialist website. And with me today is Chris Marsden, the National Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party in Britain. Hello, Chris. Hello there, Tom. Chris, today we're going to be speaking and answering our viewers' questions about what is the most consequential world crisis in decades. We're living through truly unprecedented events. I think as of yesterday, according to the official statistics, over 160,000 people have been killed by the virus globally, over 15,000 of them in Britain. And we know that these numbers, which exclude the horrific toll being taken in care homes, in country after country, and in people's own homes, don't come close to the real figure. Beyond that, we know that thousands more are sick, many of them severely, and millions have lost their jobs or are being forced to endanger their lives and those of their families by being forced to work in unsafe conditions. How do you, how would you initially appraise the global situation as it stands? That's a very good question, Tom. Um, all of the things you say are correct. I think that it bears thinking about what is, how this is presenting itself to billions of workers the world over. Two and a half million cases, and that is a massive underestimation. If you look at the news, you read any newspaper, certainly uh, every one will have some the latest outrageous statement by Donald Trump saying, don't believe the Chinese and the Iranian figures. Uh, but the working hypothesis that workers and young people should adopt is don't believe any of them. You know, we, we, we're looking at a situation in which there is a systematic campaign of misinformation about what is taking place throughout the world. Uh, as Tom pointed out, uh, we know, for example, that the statistics that are being reported only count deaths in hospitals and that's I think the case with almost every country they don't factor in care homes and they certainly don't factor in the deaths at home of many 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 more people not just of coronavirus but also the fact that people are very scared to go in hospital people are being told to self-isolate. They're told that the, uh, it's, it would be socially irresponsible to place burdens on, say, for in, in Britain, the National Health Service. And so people with very acute conditions who are placed under enormous strain are dying. And then, of course, that doesn't factor in the deliberate concealment that is taking place by governments that have got a lot to hide. So the figure of two and a half million cases could easily double. That's the first thing. Secondly, if you're looking at the world situation, I think the most remarkable uh, and salient issue is that there is absolutely no collaboration between any uh, of the major states in dealing with this uh, global pandemic. The European Union, for example, certainly German, leading German politicians, were recently forced to apologise to Italy for their failure to respond in any way to their desperate appeals when they were one of the first countries to be hit by the pandemic in Europe. But it was entirely cynical. You know, they, they just made this apology in order to keep the EU machine ticking. But all reports continue to be of a beggar thy neighbour policy pursued by every single major capitalist government from the most immediate, uh, such as the undercutting of uh, one state by another in the desperate uh, search for personal protective equipment, ventilators, etc., to a policy of funneling in literally billions, billions, trillions, in fact, into the uh, bank accounts and pockets of their uh, corporations and banks as they all prepare for trade and military war. Even, and this all takes place, even as the impact of cuts are being felt, felt uh, in healthcare, elderly care, 
and across the board. The situation confronting the working class is life-threatening when it comes to the coronavirus. It's also uh, their very livelihoods are on the line in a, in, a, in a way that's not been seen since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And as, uh, as many economists and major economic institutions are saying, is worse than the 1930s. In the United States, for example, uh, at least one of the most uh, concerned reports that was issued by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis said that the coronavirus outbreak could end up costing 47 million jobs. Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis has estimated that on an unemployment rate in the United States of 46, 47 million jobs lost. That's uh, a rate of 32 percent compared with 25 percent during the Great Depression. It's not the uh, only such estimate. For example, um, estimate from, from the IMF and the World Bank that the uh, disruption to the world economy is caused by COVID-19 is expected to wipe out 6.7% of working hours globally in the second quarter of this year. They rate that as equivalent to 195 million jobs worldwide. Uh, more than four-fifths of all workers globally are now living under partial shutdown measures. And when this all finishes, it's not going to go back to anything. There's no return to normalcy. Of course, there will be a massive uh, drive to high up the exploitation of the working class, but certainly many workers are not going to be called back into the workforce. And that is going to hit people extremely hardly hard. For example, uh, workers in the informal sector who are representing 61% of the global workforce, 2 billion people, don't have any access to any benefits whatsoever. So they'll have no means of uh, feeding their families if their jobs disappear. Um, the International Labour Organization was asked this week whether uh, how many people they thought were going to be unemployed and that all that they would commit to was that it will be significantly higher than the 25 million job losses they forecast last month. Uh, just to put that in some sort of perspective, at this point in time, 190 million workers are, un are unemployed around the world. Now, this situation is extremely explosive. It's not going, to, there's going to be no return to normalcy. It, once this pandemic is passed, there will be two things. First of all, a massive campaign will be waged to secure market share around the world between the major capitalist corporations and companies, a very vicious and brutal trade war, all sorts of tensions will emerge. And the demand everywhere will be for the working class to pay for that by accepting national sacrifice, cutting their wages, cutting their jobs, cutting their conditions, working whatever hours are required in a way that is going to be so brutal that you can't, it cannot be envisaged that this will all take place without the resort to the most extreme forms of um, authoritarian rule and police state measures against broad masses of the population. I think some of those points as well uh, draw attention to the fact that as much as the disease itself is natural in origin, the, the evolution of a particular strain of the virus, the global crisis that it's become is social in origin. It builds on or is exploiting the gutted healthcare systems of, of country after country. And you pointed to the lack of solidarity across the European Union. Of course, the severe uh, experience of the pandemic in some Southern European countries is in, in, a, in considerable part a result of the their destroyed healthcare systems, destroyed by austerity mandated by the institutions of that European Union. Perhaps you could speak a little, we could speak a little bit more about how we got here in Britain. As, as we said in the introduction, 15,000 dead. Uh, I think there's a recognition that steps could and could have been taken, ought to have been taken, uh, that would have prevented us get, prevented it ever getting to this stage. Why wasn't this done and, and, and what was done by the Johnson government? <laughs> 
Well, the, sit the situation is uh, horrific in this country, absolutely horrific. The death rate in Britain is extraordinary. If you compare, it's the second highest death rate now after the United States. Something like, I think the last figures were 880 odd compared with close to 2,000 in the United States, but you're dealing with a country there with a population much bigger. So the, the rate of death is so high. And little wonder, it, the, the picture is everything that I said about the global situation. You, you get that uh, in spades in the UK. And the latest piece I've read, National Care Forum, have esti estimated that more than 4,000 elderly and disabled people have died across residential and nursing care homes that compares with the official figure uh, acknowledged of 217. Now, whether that's correct or not, you're dealing with a, a multiple factor of deaths. In addition, as, as a result of the failure to provide personal protective equipment, at least 86 health and social care workers are believed to have died as of yesterday morning this, uh, of COVID-19. Um, as well as that, obviously, we have a situation in which uh, literally a million, I believe it's a million people applied for welfare benefits so far in the UK because they can't, can't uh, get by. That's across all, but all, all sections of the population living on 80% of their wages and they're the fortunate ones because many people on zero hours contracts are getting nothing and uh, they will be eking out existence on uh, minimal, ben minimal, minimal benefits. So this is a very desperate crisis. There are reports of one and a half million people only having one meal a day because they cannot afford to eat given the extreme, they were already in ex situations of extremists and now they're in dire straits. And that's, again, that's going to continue. Um, you asked how we got there. Well, Britain was the most, not the only country by any means, but it was the government which declared publicly that their strategy for COVID-19, and I use the, uh, the words advisedly, was herd immunity. Um, they were... This was officially acknowledged by Sir Patrick Vallance, uh, the, the uh, government's chief scientific advisor. And he said um, that their working hypothesis was that you couldn't stop the spread of the coronavirus. So they were estimating that 60% of the population should catch uh, COVID-19. And then once they recovered, uh, they would acquire the necessary antibodies to protect the rest of the population as well. Now, everybody knew that this was not the case, but let's just run with it. Uh, he was asked at the time that that would mean hundreds of thousands of dead. There were various estimations given, but he just basically replied uh, that it was a very real poss possibility. It's a nasty disease. Then, it, then the public outrage be, uh, began to be developed and it, it certainly was echoed the scientific community who said that this, uh, to call this a herd immunity strategy is completely bogus. The only way that herd immunity strategies had previously been discussed is when there was a virus because to develop a herd immunity strategy it wasn't 60% of the population that would catch the disease, it was 90%. And moreover, this is a virus that nobody knew about it's, it's full properties. There were massively varying estimations of how many people are going to die. And it's also a virus that has mutated. I, I believe, I'm, I'm not an expert on the science, but I believe there's at least three strains of it already. So this was a, a perspective for uncounted numbers of dead. Now, but yet, even in the face of all this outrage, it's just striking that the same policy was maintained for almost a fortnight afterwards, it means mounting outrage about what the government was doing. They kept to it. They really did. And I just, uh, I was, you know, looking at the internet 
last night and someone actually, I believe it was from the Squawk Box website, uh, got a, some film of Boris Johnson in February. You know, if you want to know what, what, what was obsessing the government at that time, it's quite, it was quite revealing. He has this uh, video and it was a, a, a meeting in Greenwich in which he was outlining Britain's disagreement with the European Union on uh, EU-UK trade. And I, I, this is from the speech, which you can see on the, you can see him delivering it if, if you're that way inclined. Look at this obscene individual. He says, we are starting to hear some bizarre autarkic rhetoric when barriers are going up and when there is a risk that new diseases such as coronavirus will trigger a panic and a desire for market segregation that go beyond what is medically rational at the, to the point of doing real and unnecessary economic damage, then at that moment, humanity needs some government somewhere that is willing at least to make the case powerfully for freedom of exchange, some country ready to take off its Clark Kent spectacles and leap into the phone booth and emerge with its cloak flowing as the supercharged champion of the right of the populations of the earth to buy and sell freely among others. And here in Greenwich in the first week of February 2020, I can tell you in all humility that the UK is ready for that role. So that's what he was concerned about. He wanted to be the superman, the superhero of the free market. Now, there's a piece in the, Gar uh, in the Sunday Times today, which, I mean, it's, a lot of this material was well known and certainly was well known to readers of the World Socialist website, but it was downplayed, even amidst the mounting opposition. But they point out in this article, uh, the Insight team, that in that period, Johnson didn't attend five COBRA meetings, the emergency meetings of the government to discuss the coronavirus crisis, because he was either on holiday or at checkers. And they quote a senior advisor to Downing Street and he says he liked his country breaks. He didn't work weekends. It was exactly like people feared he would be. That's Johnson. Now, in the meantime, there were all calls to order protective gear were ignored and all the warnings by numerous scientists fell on deaf ears. And the government just proceeded on its herd immunity strategy, even allowing people to go to the Cheltenham races and make bets. Handing over co coins to bookies. And it wasn't until March the 2nd, that's, after, that's five, fully five weeks, that Johnson attended a, a meeting of the uh, COBRA committee. And they also point out that contrary to the official position, Britain was in an absolute mess when it came to preparation for the pandemic. There'd been no uh, buying of emergency stockpiles of PPE, and instead they'd been allowed to uh, go out of day and were never replenished. There was no training, and no measures were put on uh, in place of any form of contingency planning, because that's just they just were not interested. Now, they also point out, just to show how completely indifferent they were, and I'm not doing, raising this in the same way the Sunday Times did, but they actually uh, sold PPE to China. You know, they, they, this was not their policy. Of course, China and many countries were considering how to protect their citizens. The Johnson government just wanted to make some money. Now, they also pointed out that, I mean, just amongst the warnings, uh, Southampton University, for example, they said they calculated that 190,000 people flew into the UK from Wuhan and other Chinese cities during that period. They were completely aware of the dangers and they were completely indifferent. But it's much worse than, uh, as we know, as every reader of the World Socialist website knows, it's much worse because they, this wasn't what they were they decided in January or December or even February. This was all de decided years ago in 2016 because they'd had that Operation Cygnus, which was 
a, a sort of a wargaming strategy for preparation for a, for a COVID-19 style um, pandemic. And their working hypothesis from that point on was that the NHS would collapse. It would collapse, that they wouldn't have enough PPE, they wouldn't have enough intensive care ventilators, and that people would die. I mean, the te and the Telegraph today has uh, actually cited some figures which I haven't seen before, but they point, this is what they say, uh, and bear in mind, this is the Sunday Telegraph. This is the Tory House organ that Boris Johnson wrote for quite lucratively. And this is their words. Britain assumed a deadly virus would inevitably cripple the NHS and kill up to 750,000 people. That was their working hypothesis when this all began. When, when Patrick Vallance was speaking about herd immunity, Whatever figures they were putting on it, the, the most serious guesstimate by professionals at that time was three quarters of a million people dying in the UK from uh, a coronavirus style disease. And they quote a Whitehall, Whitehall official, and this is what he says, everything we planned for was based on the idea that a disease would kill lots and lots of people. We didn't spend a lot of time exploring how we would prevent it in the first place. Instead, we looked at how we could build up mortuary space and intensive care beds after it had already spread. That's the government policy. That's what they were doing. And once this comes out, and what is, what is, once all this pans out, it's not that people will be clapping for Boris. They will be demanding his head because he has committed high crimes and misdemeanors against the British working class and against the working class all over the world. And of course, to add to it, the same, fundamentally the same policy or the same conceptions that underline it are in place today and are driving what we've labeled the back to work campaign that's now in action all across the world. The idea that within a relatively short period with no measures really taken to seriously suppress, let alone eradicate the threat posed by the disease, workers will be sent back to their factories, back out onto the streets to continue producing profits of the major corporations. And that ultimately this initial period of lockdown is not intended to create the space in which a serious program of testing and contact tracing and all of the things that the World Health Organization has said is necessary to actually combat the disease. It's not been to put these measures in place, it's been to give them some time to work out how they can get the working class back to producing profits. And obviously there will be problems with that. Um, but we've drawn attention to this campaign on the World Socialist website. We noted that, of course, there was as you've mentioned, a significant stock market crashes all over the world when this pandemic first, um, the virulence of it first became apparent. And then within, I forget the exact time period, but within a few days, you notice that suddenly there was a, a sudden rush, a sudden uptick in the world's stock markets. And that this was because the governments had announced their bailout packages. The major corporations knew that just like in 2008, 2009, there's no real risk involved past a certain level of, of doing business. The governments were going to bail them out and they knew that this money would be secured by the working class being sent back into the factories under unsafe conditions. Is it, perhaps there's more you can say on what is involved in the back to work campaign and some of the examples perhaps from other countries in the world. Well, yes, back to work campaigns, it just, it's universal. I mean, apart from country, uh, Sweden, which, which, which has never, never had any lockdown. And there are warnings now from medical professionals in that country saying this will, be, this will have an apocalyptic effect in the long term. There is not a country in the world which is now not actively engaged in a back to work strategy. We've cited Donald Trump and he's basically, uh, his latest tweets were saying, make no mistake, this is my policy. I might be discussing with the 
the heads of uh, the governors of various states, but I am determined to get America back to work again. He's even reached out to these far right protesters uh, organized by Infowars and sites such as that, militia types saying that, you know, this is about freedoms. America's got, this is what America is all about. You know, this is all about work. The economy has got to get going. Perhaps less uh, with less bellicosity. That is the position which is being pioneered in Spain. Uh, in that, in this instance, involving a government of the Socialist Party in Podemos, the pseudo left tendency that was uh, the one of the great hopes of the um, international radical fraternity. They're pulling it. They did a breakdown in the Guardian, for example, of all the states in Europe. Uh, that were implementing measures sometime between late April, mid-May, including getting the schools back together, getting uh, non-essential workers back, back to work, so on and so forth. Um, schools, very important. And they did this, just to make how, how clear, they accompanied this with a graph of how much they thought the uh, hit to their economies was going to be if that didn't take place. So economics versus life as we point out capitalism means um, death and the working class fighting against this to preserve it is in the struggle for for life i mean it's that naked that brutal in what's striking for me is just how dangerous that is for the johnson government I mean, here's a strange thing that the government that was most open about the herd immunity strategy is having some of the biggest difficulties going back to it. Now, it's not because they won't do it, because they will. In fact, the, all of the discussion, one of the, all the papers this morning were all filled with leaks about what the uh, back to work strategy would be. And it involves, um, in typical, you know, soundbite fashion, uh, red, amber, green, like a series of traffic lights. And red is get the schools back. Now, of course, we, you know, th th this was all prepared. You know, apparently there's no threat from schools. You know, we really under overestimated the danger of... Uh, the children of adult parents mingling together in school and then coming home on public transport. And this, and this is going to have statistically no impact on the coronavirus. It probably wasn't even good to do it in the first place. This is a sort of rewriting that's taking place. The AMBER policy is all non-essential workers back to work and everything apart from some pubs and restaurants, which will then be phased in a few weeks after that. And the green is when, uh, for a period, you would have to uh, cocoon, the cocoon, seven, uh, the older end of the population in care homes and at home. And that might take a, a, at least another year before they will be allowed to rejoin this uh, great society so in, in actual fact from from an economic standpoint there's only two parts of this strategy red and amber because green is it, their attitude to the uh, aged and the infirm has already been made apparent which is to hell with you you can go you can just die where you're put I mean, the herd immunity strategy, as we pointed out, took us taking on the character of a cull. To cull those that are, are not considered profitable. Now, what's the driving force for this? Well, we, we've written on it, and I, I strongly urge all our readers who have not studied them with, the, with due care and attention to study the two perspectives written by David North on this issue. And the one in uh, in today in today's 
Saturday's edition of the uh, World Socialist website. But this was a deliberate policy, a conscious policy. In the United States, trillions were, they, 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 they spent their time, this was a crisis that were, was coming and they wanted to funnel massive amounts into the pockets of the super rich and they did it. That was what they were concerned with. That's what the meetings were about. Same in Britain, 350 billion. And that's a down payment. All these things were done with no opposition in, in the UK, not even with a token opposition from the Labour Party. And now they want people to get back to work. And whatever the problems are, they, the issue for them is how do you create the best conditions for doing it? I mean, they're speaking about Boris Johnson coming back. There's a headline in the Daily Telegraph, Boris takes control or some such nonsense. The same with the Daily Mail. They're saying that we couldn't do this without Boris. Who are they kidding? I mean, do they really believe that Boris Johnson has popular standing in the country? I mean, it's more the case that they're, they're worried about the political response and they don't want to be the person on the uh, uh, being targeted for future retribution for what they're about to do. But they, this is what they're discussing. And it, the dates, only the dates, they're saying, when do we do the schools? You know, three or four dates are being put forward. And then after that, when do we do the next stage? When do the next stage? Sooner or later, they're going to go back. And this is after epide epidemiologists have said and acknowledged, and government sources have acknowledged, that they're not speaking about simply a second wave of the coronavirus. They're speaking about a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, and an eighth wave of the coronavirus. So they're speaking about deaths for a long time to come. If I just to yeah. carry on. No, well, to underline that point, I mean, we quoted it in an article on the World Socialist website, a, the deputy medical officer of the Home Office in a leaked uh, internal call in that department in relation to the sending back to work of, I think it was 2,000 office workers in the passport department of the Home Office. And this deputy medical officer, Rupert Shute, was quoted as saying, it's perfectly OK to carry on around your business. And it's vitally important that you do so as there's a whole bunch of supply chains and the economy that needs to continue running. I keep coming back to this point that we are all going to get this coronavirus at some point. We can't hide away from it forever, but we can manage the way in which we are exposed. It's certainly not something we're going to be able to squash and eliminate. And then he carries on to say, talk for the moment is around a peak and managing the current outbreak. This doesn't mean there isn't going to be a second, third, fourth, fifth, or even more peaks as we go into many months and many years. We're going to have to get used to a different way of living with this at home and at work. And that was a long time after the official, the policy of herd immunity had officially been dropped. And a long time after all of these warnings had been made by leading eminent epidemiologists uh, rubbishing that as a, as a strategy, which as you rightly said, is, is no strategy at all. I thought you made an interesting point about <laughs> the idea that somehow Boris Johnson is the man who needs to be at the wheel to, to save British capitalism. I mean, in fact, in other circles, the argument that's beginning to be developed is that really what's going to be necessary at a later stage in this crisis is the development of a government of national unity. And that in fact, the new leader of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, is going to be the man who has the weight of that responsibility on his shoulders. And lo and behold, it's the Labour Party who has made really its sole criticism of the government over the coronavirus pandemic. The fact that there isn't an exit strategy, mm. that there isn't a back to work plan. I and mean, what, how would you assess Labour's role in this crisis? Well, I'd agree with everything you just said, Tom, but uh, th with one proviso that this is not down the line. This is now uh, the, the Daily Mail today in its report its front page was uh, something like Get Britain Moving. And they speak about the fact that there is already a grand coalition uh, emerging of senior uh, political figures, both from the Tory party uh, business, but with the most prominent role being played by Sir Keir Starmer, who's meeting with the likes of David Davis and Ian Duncan Smith, who have been identified as the most bellicose in the get back to work strategy. Now, of course, Stam is doing his usual uh, stuff and nonsense about 
this is all about uh, getting this discussion out in the open and being accountable, but that's all lies, transparent lies. What he's basically putting himself forward as is the spokesperson, the front man for a get back to work strategy in which he will claim all of you, know, he'll be bleeding crocodile tears from every pore about the fate of the, of the worker. When it's just, this is all about the profits of big business. They have to claw back as much money, as much profit as possible at the backs of the working class, no matter what the cost, no matter how many people die. Now he's, uh, it was interesting. Uh, you had uh, new statesman. Uh, they've endorsed it. Why does Keir Starmer keep banging on about an exit strategy? Um, he says he's written a letter to Dominic Raab asking again that ministers publish a, a, an exit a lockdown strategy. Um, now, he was talking earlier on, and, and we wrote on it, the first thing he spoke about was the possibility of a coalition government. Uh, they even gave an interview to uh, Pe Robert Peston on the BBC, and he said, don't know yet but we're certainly not going to be the ones to criticize the government. We're going to be very um, positive and proactive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it might not be the time to join a coalition government. Well, here's the thing. Without any discussion, we've already got a coalition government. There is no difference whatsoever between the Labour Party and Johnson's government on any fundamental issue with respect to the coronavirus crisis, except for one. And that is when Sir Keir Starmer commits himself to the most right-wing elements within the most right-wing government Britain's ever seen. That's what's taking place. And none of it is meeting a shred of opposition from uh, the Labour left. Nothing. In fact, uh, I saw, I didn't even see it, I didn't see it until um, this morning, but for instance, Corbyn has pledged his loyalty to Sakir Starmer, even as, as his, his uh, acolytes have revealed the fact that there was a massive systematic campaign to purge him and tens of thousands of Labour Party members from the party on the basis of trumped up accusations of anti-Semitism. Even after that, he pledged his loyalty to, to Sir Keir Starmer. And he was interviewed in Al Jazeera on the coronavirus crisis, and it was like business as usual. He says, uh, was it the quote, I just couldn't believe these quotes because they were so, um, he says, the coronavirus crisis has emphasized just how unequal our planet is, how unequal our societies are in the USA, Britain and Europe and many other parts of the world. After the coronavirus, it can never be the same again. The impact is globally is different in different places. The impact is on the poorest, on the poorest communities is the greatest. The world is going to be a different place post COVID and it cannot be a global retrenchment and global austerity. It's got to be that we recognise health inequalities are a danger to everyone. Even the well-off and healthy are in danger of health inequalities. We will have we will have a more inclusive society in future. So he, he begins by saying there's massive inequalities that have been revealed by the coronavirus crisis, and he closes by saying even the well-off and healthy are in danger because of that. And we're going to have a more inclusive society. Amen. As Her Majesty said. Uh, <laughs> there is nothing coming from the left. They've got nothing to say. What's, what's very clear is Sir Keir Starmer is the leader that they wanted. They're all working with him now. They were forced to put on a, a show of opposition because of the massive hostility to Blairism, to new, new Labour, to austerity and militarism that erupted uh, in 2015. And they've spent the next five years 
demobilizing it and preparing for business as usual, but not under usual circumstances. Mm. What, what Corbyn has done is fashion a vehicle led by Sir Keir Starmer that is now getting ready to take its place alongside the Tories in political, social and economic warfare against the British working class. That's what and he... That, hmm. And their allies in that fight have, of course, been the trade unions who have... I mean, you made the point to me the other day that one has to continually be reminded that the Trade Union Congress exists because it has so little impact in the current situations, other than, of course, to, again, with the proviso, demobilise opposition that does develop in the working class. I mean, we've written quite extensively on the remarkable situation uh, in, the, in Royal Mail uh, with regard to the Communication Workers Union, the CWU, which going into this pandemic, had been organising a ballot for strike action that had already been called off twice before, had been demobilised in the face of a very reactionary anti-democratic high court injunction. That ballot came in with a yes vote for strike action of something over 95%, at which point the CWU immediately off cancelled it in effect and offered their membership up as an additional emergency service for, not for the working class, but for Boris Johnson's government and quote, the nation. That's been rattling on for two weeks or so. Now it's become very, very clear that their fraudulent uh, olive branches to the or fraudulent appeals to the employer to implement some uh, form of safety measures in the workplace have fallen on deaf ears. Uh, and the union continue to refuse even to mention the word strike or the phrase industrial action. And we're now seeing the very, very severe consequences of that. I know at least three post workers have died already officially. I'm sure the number is much higher, some 20%, I think it's 26,000 are self-isolating at home, either sick themselves or having to look after family members. And many, many, many of those, there aren't figures, but are not gaining access to any sort of financial support in this period. I believe the Royal Mail has said that if you're ill yourself, you require a doctor's note to say that you've got the coronavirus to receive any sort of additional um, sick pay which anyone who knows anything about the conditions of testing and the availability of um, healthcare or an appointment with a doctor uh, will recognize for the cynical gesture that it is uh, and if there's nothing available to people who are staying at home to look after families loved ones and friends i mean this is obviously not unique to that industry it's perhaps most naked in there but perhaps you could speak also we know we've encountered similar obviously in the health unions and the transport unions it's a similar situation for london bus workers for example well oh, that's true tom I, I just for anybody who's not aware uh, you wrote an article at the beginning of this uh, farago with the communication workers a massive massive vote for strike action and they they said that they weren't not only were they not going to implement it they were going to offer up the postal workers as a fifth emergency service. Now, since that time, nine, I think nine offices, might be 10 depots have gone out in unofficial action because there's no protection. I mean, you're not talking about minor things, you're talking about no sanit hand sanitizers, no gloves, no masks, no hot water, no, no changing working practices, no toilet facilities people people go go out to work after mingling with fellow workers and then they come into regular contact with the public their lives are in danger nothing and you wrote that article you wrote an article and actually got posted by a postal worker on uh, royal mail chat and uh, i believe today it's got close to 2,000 viewings. That's one of our articles. If you take the last five or so, I think it's got, we've got something like six and a half, 7,000 uh, readings. Amongst a site that's basically dedicated to postal workers, you've got 110,000 postal workers in this country. So that's a he heavy readership. And the vitriol that was leveled, <laughs> leveled against you uh, was <laughs> extraordinary. I mean, you are an evil, evil man. But the, but the desperation of it is 
indicative of the role that they're playing. And there's no unions which are different. That's the role of the unions all over the world. You know, every action, that, uh, as far as I can see, I might have missed a few, but it's generally the action that's been taken by the working class has been taken in a rebellion against the trade unions. A long time before Keir Starmer was speaking about a government of national unity, the, U the TUC was already meeting with the government to uh, support its strategy. So, yes, what I said to you, I, I, I maintain, you know, sometimes you have to remind yourself that the trade unions exist, but they do exist. And behind the scenes, their entire role is the suppression of the class struggle. You know, because that is the fundamental issue. None of this would have unfolded in the way that it is outside of the role of the labour and trade union bureaucracy and their lackeys in the pseudo left groups. All of the preparation for what is now unfolding, the terrible catastrophe confronting the working class was laid down by the labour and trade union bureaucracy, suppressing the class struggle. Jeremy Corbyn was given a golden opportunity to do something which he would, was never had any intention of doing. And everybody, there was an entire machinery to lie to the working class, to say that this represented a golden opportunity to transform the Labour Party into a vehicle for fighting austerity, militarism and war. And the net result of that is not simply Keir Starmer sitting uh, in uh, Labour Party HQ. The net result is Boris Johnson, his criminal policy and the deaths of thousands of working people. That's the price which is paid by the working class for the continued domination of the Labour and Trade Union bureaucracy. And that's why, as we said, the Labour Party would never recover from the Corbyn experiment. Because the big myths have already been exploded. The idea that anything could be achieved through the Labour Party is dead in the water. And the working class is going to start looking for a genuine socialist alternative under conditions in which its very lives are on the line. We just had a, a comment on the video which points out in relation to what we were saying about the Royal Mail, which says, um, our local post worker said his base was so tiny and squashed and Victorian, in his words, it was impossible to maintain safe distance and they only had gloves for protection. I mean, it is, it's that widespread that you can mention it and someone's got a story about it. I was uh, fortunate enough to participate in a rank and file meeting of an independent committee of post workers in Australia, where the situation with the pandemic is not as developed as it is in Britain. Obviously, it's still a major concern. And it's as many of these as you participate in, it's always striking how similar the issues that come up are. I mean, it's always the case that a, a worker in one industry in one country can be dropped into the same industry in every other any other country and immediately strike up a, a conversation about the same sorts of issues. I mean, it was, again, the fact that no real social distancing is allowed to take place. Of course, like everywhere else in Australia, post workers are twice as busy as they are as uh, individuals like Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon and the rest, rake in the billions in the context of this pandemic and the confinement of, of billions to their homes. Uh, post workers there as well in individual workplaces were given no information about the spread of the virus throughout workplaces. There are lies told that there have been no cases or that if there have, the depot has been cleaned. And the union there as well make absolutely no effort to inform Work, work forces across different depots of the situation. They don't only isolate between industries, but between or well, between workplaces. And even uh, I heard one story of not letting the next shift know that someone had fallen in on the shift before the, the union rep uh, was on the early shift left and didn't think it was necessary to tell the workers coming in afterwards that uh, obviously there could be a danger of infection. Um, I think that right and as as well and the response that you mentioned to our post workers uh, articles demonstrate that all that all that you said about corbyn and labor is true and that crucially it is not a reflection of some sort of lack of willingness of the working class to fight or some lack of recognition of what's going on in fact we've seen 
when we directly address the working class and ask them to write in with their experiences and address the, the, the issues that they're facing, that we get a mass response. And in fact, you know, as you know, our, the World Socialist website, our various forms of communication have seen a, a dramatic increase in their readership and in the sort of interaction that we're seeing with, with key sections of the working class. Well, I think, you know, we can, we can speak about that and it's an important issue. I, I just wanted to raise one, one other question of what the World Socialist website represents and what the situation is in, in, the, in the working class. I mean, we, we uh, were um, sent in a letter from a, a health worker, a nurse, uh, at the, um, is it Royal Brighton? I can't remember what it's actually. Bournemouth. Royal Bournemouth, sorry. And he just detailed the situation. It was just horrific because he was working in a, co uh, a COVID ward, he or she. And he just spoke about uh, the lack of PPE, the terrible hours, the conditions, etc. And it went viral for us. Uh, 80,000 viewings the last time I looked for that article, taken up hundreds of times on Facebook and other social media. Workers coming in and say, this is what it's like, this tells it like it is. There was a sort of put-up attack on it by someone who says, I am a frontline worker, uh, I am not a manager, uh, this is not a lie and everything you say is untrue and everything is rosy. There's a rosy glow over everything to do with it. Yeah. And we're just applying the advice of the government as if that is a defense. And every and then there was just one attack on him after another, this, this Mr. Anonymous who wrote in to attack uh, the article. But it's everywhere. I mean, it's on the buses. His taxi drivers. There was a report. I, I'm sorry, I don't have his name in front of me. There was what one taxi driver was. Uh, it was uh, an immigrant, an Uber driver, and he and he died at home because he was afraid to go into the hospital. They're now saying that many Im immigrants are dying because they're scared to go into the NHS, and there's been an appeal not to con not to investigate them. You know that if if someone falls ill. However, even if they just fall ill and they're in this kind of a job, there's an enormous pressure not to acknowledge it because you will not work again. I mean, this is a, this is a catastrophe and it's a deliberate policy. And to return to it, to return to what we're saying, all of this was known. All of this was factored in. There are no surprises. They were told how many people would die. And they said it's a, it's a price worth paying. In fact, they've conducted a this is an official policy now just just to reverse roles because you've been asking me questions and, and so on and forth but you wrote quite extensively on the relationship between this government and the uh, notions associated with eugenics including um policies of the elimination of the uh, sick, the infirm, and the supposedly genetically inferior. And really, this is the most graphic demonstration that that policy was not a backroom interest, you know, some quirks among certain Tories, but was has informed official government policy. Do you, would you like to say anything on that, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, wherever it comes up, it's always... As you say, it's presented in the corporate media as some sort of quirk or oddball that somehow found their way into the halls of power. And what we drew attention to is the fact that there was a clear pattern of this. It takes different forms. Uh, the most naked was, of course, the appointment of a man called Andrew Sabisky to a special to the position of special advisor to the government, uh, a man who had previously directly advocated eugenic type policies. Uh, and who held the view that is quite common amongst particularly senior members of the Tory party, that intelligence in particular is ultimately overwhelmingly genetic and that frankly we just have to acknowledge the fact that there is a vast difference in the natural capabilities which are unalterable in this argument between different human beings and the vastly 
the ter terribly unequal society that we see is a reflection of that fact. Uh, Johnson gave a speech um, some years ago to that effect. Dominic Cummings authored a paper uh, that this is Cummings is uh, Johnson's chief special advisor. He authored a paper when he was advising Michael Gove when he was education secretary, essentially arguing that a, a rounded education for working class children was pointless because well, the, the fact that they were working class represented uh, their inferior genetic stock. And it reaches the, the, the vicious level of a, a Tory um, prospective parliamentary candidate referring to uh, people on a, a program that cover, uh, looks at people on social security and commenting on social media that these people need putting down uh, all the way over to Jacob Rees-Mogg, the sort of house aristocrat of the Tory party, uh, commenting that he and his interviewer would have been more likely to survive the horrific Grenfell Tower, of, Tower fire uh, because it, they had more, they had the common sense to do so by implication, of course, meaning that the residents themselves didn't, the poor residents didn't. I mean, to understand the role that it plays, you've got to recognize, I think, that historically eugenics and the broader ideology which accompanies it of social Darwinism, i.e. that the strong survive and prosper, and that's the way it should be, have always come to the fore when the class struggle has reached a particular pitch of, intense, of high intensity. I mean, it initially emerged in the late 1800s really as a direct answer to the rising socialist movement, which was gaining a mass audience in the working class. I mean, when Marxism explained the origins of poverty and inequality in the exploitation of the working class um, and of global inequality and imperialist depression, social Darwinism basically answered that, no, 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 these inequalities you see are the product of different qualities of human being, different grades of human being. Um, it's in that sense, a, a pseudo-scientific, pseudo-philosophical justification for social inequality under capitalism and its most abhorrent consequences in terms of shortened lives um, and, and generally oppressed lives. It flows from the socioeconomic interests of the capitalist class. And you can see that process in motion today very very clearly you know the Johnson government were determined as you've explained to ignore the pandemic to continue running business as usual to keep profits flowing and to prevent money financial resources being diverted from their rightful owners in the ruling its rightful owners in the ruling class to public health measures and, and uh, public health resources and to do so they leaned on the ideological support or crutch, which is provided by any number of newspaper columnists, right wing newspaper columnists or academics who see that their services are needed, who provide what is presented as a moral argument that some people matter less and more than that, that really it's, it's moral that the weak shuffle out of the way in society. Uh, this is always advanced behind the sort of a sort of smiling, benevolent face which in this case uh, is saying that we need to, society as a whole needs to confront the reality of death, that we need to put more attention into end of life care, even more nakedly as has anyone asked the elderly if they actually want to, in essence to carry on living. And obviously there's all sorts of legitimate points about uh, dignity in later life. That's not the concern that's motivating these arguments. What it's essentially saying and arguing is that past a certain point, life, the continuation of life is really unnatural. And how is that certain point to be determined? It's to be determined by the amount of wealth and therefore of healthcare resources that a particular individual can command. It's a, it, it comes back full circle to the justification of social inequality. But they're actually now, you know, that if, if, if most people were asked to sum up, for example, the philosophy of social Darwinism, it would, you know, the, the, taking Darwin's findings from uh, th the theory of evolution and, and bastardizing it to this statement, survival of the fittest. Mm. But that's the official policy now. Mm, absolutely. You know, I... it, 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 they've released that, um, those guidelines for who's supposed to get treatment, haven't they, and, uh, whether it's in for ventilation, etc. Yeah, absolutely, which rather than having the conversation about how we move the 
vast amount of resources that exist in society to where they're needed to providing adequate healthcare for everyone, uh, moving out of the billionaire class and into public healthcare. The conversation is about, and the, the philosophers are summoned and the moral, the ethicists are summoned to discuss how we apportion and ration healthcare on the basis of, a, of what is a system of, of ranking life um, and of being counting about what the value of a, of a human life is. There's this line that keeps coming out. Uh, we mustn't let the cure be worse than the disease. I, we, we, these lockdowns mustn't be allowed to so terribly impact economic life um, that they cause, as they put it, more death than the disease itself. Now, of course, if, if which, which, it, which is the statement that's highlighted in the uh, in this weekend's perspective from mm -hmm. Roger Cohen, from the, I believe, from the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, there's an, an, an innumerable citations in that piece, isn't there, from the, which make very clear that the ideas of the of very far right conceptions associated with fascism are now re-emerging with full force within substantial sections of the bourgeoisie and its ide ideologues. I mean, for instance, I mean, it, not many people, because it, this caused something of a crisis and they dropped it very quickly. But it wasn't just the uh, pensioners in the age age that were saying they weren't going to get treatment. They also did the same thing for people with uh, like Down syndrome and with uh, you know serious illnesses. They were also going to be sacrificed, weren't they? Mm. I mean, this is the sort of stuff that's associated with the Nazis in in Germany in the nineteen thirties. That you know the what what did uh, Hitler call them? The empty eaters. Mm. Absolutely. And, you know, this, the 1930s is the last time in which, 1930s and 40s, in which these ideas were brought to their, their full and terrible conclusions. Uh, and it wasn't, although it was carried furthest and most terribly in, in the Third Reich, Nazi Germany, it wasn't the sole preserve of the, ruling, of the German ruling class. The ideas were really first developed in Britain and were given their first mass implementation in the United States with programs of mass sterilization used to justify the exclusion of immigrants, uh, mainly from, I believe, Eastern Europe and Asia from the United States on the basis that ultimately these people couldn't preserve, um, couldn't provide an economic benefit to the United States. It was, it was universal in the ruling class and it's coming, it's never gone away. It had to go, it was sent to the shadows after the reaction to the horrors of the Second World War forced it to do so. But it's always lingered there and it's been preserved by enough wealthy benefactors ready to be brought to the fore again when class relations reach such a pitch and the interests of the working class and the ruling class are so diametrically opposed that this sort of fascistic argument needs to be developed, needs to be brought, brought out of their arsenal. Um, well, that's the, that's the key question. Mm. I mean, why, why do these things re-emerge? because social tensions, so class antagonisms have, have indeed reached a fever pitch. And it's not, what's happening now, it's, you know, I, ideologically, this is extraordinary. All of the uh, social nostrums that justified the profit system are being blown up, uh, rather than cap capitalists uh, taking the risks and getting the rewards for their enterprise. Um, they're just sucking money out of society, being handed, handed it over by governments which they control. So that the billionaires and trillionaires and God, figures which people can't even comprehend become increasingly wealthy, the Jeff Bezos of this world. Whereas everybody else is just on a downward spiral into poverty and destitution. So the whole society, it, 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 can't, it can't defend life, it can't offer a job, it can't offer any security, your home's in danger, the health service in danger, your, your children don't get educated, you won't get a pension. I mean, they're now speaking about getting rid of the triple lock, for example, on the pension, because we can no longer afford it. So everybody's pensions is just going to be eroded to nothing. If you ever get to become a pensioner 
anymore. I mean, that's a thing of the past because now you, you should, be, should be prepared to die early and die in pain. So this is where we're at. And then these ideological nostrums that were put to one side in the post-war period after that horrific experience of fascism everything the terrible things which happened 60 70 million dead the holocaust and all of that never again none of that would emerge again and yet now it does one right-wing government after another coming to power and all of the ideological filth of the past re-emerging with full force directed against the working class and all of that also i think this should be understood because the new normal is what we're speaking of now and what will that new normal be it will be the most brutal forms of exploitation imposed upon tens and hundreds of millions of working people by a class who's now celebrating conceptions which were absolutely impermissible for a whole period, that were confined to the fringes of society. There's really nothing different between what is being said in, in official government circles than what used to come out of these the, the small uh, scattered fragments of fascist tendencies all over the world. They're, be, they're being elevated into the centre of political discourse, political life, because that's a warning for what the working class has got to confront. Yeah, and it, it, I think on that point, we're running up to, to halfway or so. I'd just like to draw our viewers' attention to the opportunity to donate that's being put up on the screen now. Unfortunately, funds aren't automatically allocated to political movements in line with the scale of their political tasks and we'll get on to what our, our program is in the in the second part of this meeting our ability to do our work comes from the support and the self-sacrifice of workers and young people who recognize the burning necessity of what it is we set out to and have to achieve um, especially in the conditions of this pandemic where and global crisis which on the one hand bring countless new challenges and on the other interrupt for the time being your ability to to as it were physically uh, lend us support a financial contribution and if at all possible a regular contribution or, and donation becomes all the more vital to us if you agree with the analysis you've heard so far here today if you've been following particularly the world socialist website for some time and recognize the necessity for the building of an independent mass internationalist party of the working class represented by by ourselves, the Socialist Equality Britain and our, uh, in Britain and our sister parties elsewhere, then do please consider what donation and contribution you can make. Follow the link uh, that's that's on the screen now. Just to restart the discussion, I mean, we're getting a few questions on this point and we mentioned Sir Keir Starmer earlier, of course, the former Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, a role in which he played a criminal role in the persecution of the current political prisoner and the most significant journalist of the 21st century, Julian Assange, there are all manner of concerns uh, that flow from the current situation in British prisons for his health, in addition to all of the other concerns that were already uh, attendant to that trial. Would you like to speak a bit about particularly perhaps the campaign that the Socialist Equality Party has, has waged over Assange and the, and the dangers that are now posed to, posed to his life in so many ways? Well, I think it is striking that the campaign uh, for Assange's freedom, which we were the only political tendency that consistently fought for that. I mean, obviously, there was you know, many people fought in defence of Julian Assange for a whole period. But from a consistent socialist standpoint, we were alone. He was completely betrayed and abandoned by the pseudo left tendencies the world over from 2012 onwards and even then they, they were somewhat ambivalent towards him and he was abandoned by the social democrats the trade union apparatuses all over the world and nowhere more so than in the uk 
I mean, the Labour Party has played a key role in isolating Assange and delivering him into the terrible predicament that he now finds himself in Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison after decades of uh, imprisonment, isolation in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, sorry, after years in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, with his health terribly compromised, uh, his immune system terribly compromised, and um, with a, a lung condition, which is the worst possible condition to have with the, the coronavirus pandemic, and under conditions now in which coronavirus has proved to be not just rampant throughout the prison system, but within Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison, amongst both prisoners and staff, in which Assange is being kept in there by a vindictive uh, judicial system, despite the fact that he has no charges against him. In fact, they argued that the, Vanessa Bar Justice Judge Vanessa Barretz has said that he wouldn't be released when others were being released because he because he's not serving a sentence. I mean, it was truly Orwellian statements were being made. And he cannot be freed. Now, as we wrote at the time, that what conclusion could be drawn from this? Because they want him dead. They want Assange dead. And if they don't kill him in Belmarsh, they want nothing to stand in the way for, it, for, for, for his uh, being extradited to the United States to be silenced forever to face charges that carry a sentence of 175 years in prison. Now, what was our campaign? Our campaign was not simply to fight for Assange's freedom, but to offer a way that that freedom could be secured against simply moral appeals, or at least of all, appeals for a change of heart from Jeremy uh, Corbyn, the Labour Party, the trade unions, Amnesty International, as we said, if you're going to free Assange, you have to understand why he's imprisoned. He's in prison because he alerted broad layers of working, the working class and young people to imperialist war crimes. And they decided to silence him. And whatever excuses were put by the trade unions, by the Labour Party, by the pseudo lieutenancies, generally which focused on the regurgitation of the lies that there was that Assange had committed uh, some sort of sexual crimes in Sweden, when everyone knew that this was a frame up. The real reason why they wouldn't defend Julian Assange is because they were defenders of imperialism and apologists for its war crimes. The pseudo left tendencies, for example, were supporters of wars which um, WikiLeaks had exposed. Events in one can cite Libya and Syria as examples in which they were de they were advocates for the so-called opposition movements that were exposed in various uh, leaks by WikiLeaks. And even more than the identity politics, which they utilized to isolate Assange, that was the underlying reason for it. They were politically opposed. They, they're a pro-imperialist tendency. And it's the same with Corbyn. Corbyn, in his cups, and certainly before he became Labour leader, said that he opposed what was taking place, the victimisation of Julian Assange. But as soon as he became Labour leader, and it meant actually challenging, for example, the Blairites and opposing their pro-war agenda, because that's the only way that you could free Julian Assange, then a wall of silence descended. And now, once he's no longer the leader, he makes a few statements for the record and then re resumes his long silence. The same with John McDonnell and the rest. 
And this is under conditions where uh, Assange's life is in, in danger. It really is in danger. So our campaign has been a political campaign, a political campaign to mobilize the only social force that can defeat imperialism, which is the working class. And we're going to continue that. And in the, coronavirus, in the coronavirus crisis and the world that will follow the coronavirus crisis, because make no mistake, there will be a return to work and life will, be, will resume with all of the dangers that that brings with it, including the threat to life, then the issue of Julian Assange will emerge with renewed force as part of a developing movement of the international working class for socialism. Because he represents, his fate represents the fate which imperialism has in store for anyone that opposes its crimes. And all of the tendencies that sought to denigrate and isolate Assange have themselves been discredited. Discredited, by, yes, by what they did to him, and no one should ever forget it, and no one should ever forgive it, but also by what they've, they're going to do in, in the political struggles that are now on the agenda. The Labour Party, you know, the, all the Corbyn flim-flam has gone. And the Labour Party is revealed for what it always was, a pro-imperialist tendency. That he's going to be working with the Tories directly against the working class. And no one outside of the uh, willfully mendacious will put forward the Labour left, the Jeremy Corbyns of this world, or, his, or Rebecca Long Bailey, God help us all, as an opposition tendency. A different political parties that dominated the scene for a long time are in an advanced state of collapse, and new ones are emerging, which you can see in what's happening with the World Socialist website and the growing influence and authority of our parties, the socialist equality parties, in every single country. As you said, the, we always held that the fight to defend Assange was always bound up, not only with a fight to defend democratic rights, but a f in the building of a mass socialist anti-war movement, which, and you said that this is going to become a major issue in the working class. It is on, it is on that basis as well. I mean, I think something that will perhaps not have surprised people, but shocked and repulsed them, is that even under these conditions of a, of a terrible pandemic, the United States in particular has not let up and has in fact its war drive and has in fact uh, made an ally of the virus as a weapon of war against some of its enemies in terms of the continuing of sanctions against uh, Venezuela and against Iran with unknown uh, potential casualties flowing from that. There are a couple of questions which we've had in uh, which are on a related point, which I think we could address now, uh, which refer to the developing campaign in the, the West media against China. One uh, viewer writes in, as we know from previous experiences, political, social and economic crisis at home requires an external enemy to externalize it even when one does not exist. It would appear the Chinese regime now finds itself in a similar situation to that which Saddam Hussein's regime found itself prior to the second Persian Gulf War. Given the US administration's insistence on promoting the anti-China narrative of the false relation between the uh, lab in Wuhan and COVID-19, is what we are seeing in particular from the side of the United States a conscious decision to further raise the escalation of war preparations against China? And a second question which asks us to address the accusations of Trump against China for crimes against humanity surrounding the release of the virus, but simultaneously uh, Trump's removing of funding from the World Health Organization for favoring China, uh, despite the fact, as the, the questioner says, they are one of the only institutions carrying out an effective fight against the pandemic. Well, the point about it is, is that that's, a, that's a, perhaps the greatest uh, of many abominations is that they're using the coronavirus pandemic to step up trade and military war at a very time when the common fate of humanity 
the fact that we all rely on each other is burning itself into the consciousness of broad mass of the population. You have political criminals like Trump and his coterie, but not just Trump, certainly the Johnson government, who are now saying that, you know, really the, the, the main thing is to step up an international campaign uh, targeting in particular China. I agree with everything you said about Venezuela and Iran. You know, it's a common thing, you know, Trump saying that Iran's lied and all the rest. But this really is focusing on China and it's focusing on China, not simply because that's where the pandemic began, but because that China is seen as a major global competitor to the United States. And they're very clear about this. Now, and what and the, what they're using is so cynical. I mean, they're speaking about um, this uh, institution in Wuhan, the uh, the uh, what, what I forgot the name is. I've got here. She Seng Li. Uh, they call her the Bat Woman because she specialises in studying um, viruses that begin in animal populations and then spread into the human population uh, with particular reference to bats. And so she's based in Wuhan as, is, Wuhan, as is her institution. Now, when she's doing these investigations into, into these connections, and then there's a pandemic, uh, you see uh, uh, the, the viruses are in fact crossed into the human population from animals, and they don't know what's caused it. You know, there's some speculation it comes from this like uh, live market in Wuhan. As a responsible scientist, she says, is, it, is there any possibility that this could have come out of my laboratory? And they launch a major investigation and she concludes that the evidence from simply a timeline refutes a connection between her laboratory and the outbreak in Wuhan, and she breathes a sigh of relief, only somewhere down the line for Donald Trump and his uh, you know, filthy supporters to make out that this is proof positive that this was a virus engineered in China and released into the population in order to, I, I don't know, various excuse, uh, reasons for it, prove the superiority of the Chinese system I mean, just what, the wildest stuff, but that's not stopping it from developing because there's a need for it. I mean, you've made the point, you know, it's, it's, it's become something of a um, cliche within the world's socialist website, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Well, this is one re use for the crisis, which is, to legitimize and justify trade and military war. And that is not just simply directed against uh, their opponents. I read, and I, I apologize um, before I even do it. I can't apologize enough, but I'm going to quote Jeremy Clarkson in the Times. Now this is not, no one wants to quote Jeremy Clarkson. However, it has the advantage of being, because he's such a brutal thug of an individual, you know, and as uh, the comedian Stuart Lee pointed out, it's only a joke. But this is what he says in his uh, Sunday Times column this week. It's titled, we definitely can't blame the Germans this time. So wealthy second homers get a kick in instead. He says in this piece, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing like mad because it's a long diatribe, as one can, would assume from this man. He says the lockdown is, is not bringing out the best in people. The lockdown is turning most people into, into monsters. And why are they monsters? It's because there's been criticism of Gordon Ramsay, the chef, uh, Rita Ora, the pop star, David Beckham, the uh, ex-footballer, and the Queen for going to their second homes. 
and he finds this outrageous uh, that there's a populist streak in this, they're targeting the rich. There's a sentiment against the rich developing and he says, the big problem is that when the pandemic is over, things will get much worse as millions emerge blinking into the light to find that they have no food, jobs, pension or savings, anger will mold their bitterness into a petrol bomb, especially now that petrol, bo petrol is so cheap. He then complains, going on from that, in addition, literally everyone wants government cash. And he says, and he wants, and literally everyone isn't going to get it. He then says, some people think it's, I mean, it basically results to the magic monetary argument that people think there's just unlimited cash. And then he says, others who have a slightly, in brackets, better understanding of fiscal issues will say the problem can be addressed by taxing the rich. He says, because there are so many people like this out there who think the rich should be taxed, and because social media gives them a voice, this government will not survive the post-virus apocalypse. And Q. K. Starmer, he says, we are told that two million could lose their jobs, but it could be four million, it could be six. We've already seen footage from Italy of enraged families trying to kick their way through the supermarket's windows, and it's likely this will happen here too. And this is his conclusion. To prevent this kind of social meltdown, it's imperative we, we find someone to blame for all our problems. And he concludes, in the First and Second World Wars, there were unimaginable hardships. But the country was united because everyone knew who was to blame, the Germans. All our negative energy was focused on them, not one another. Sadly, these days, it is considered racist to blame a country and its people and their penchant for eating wildlife. But I think it would be healthier for everyone if we could. Now, that script of all the highfalutin stuff summarizes the purpose and function of xenophobia and anti-Chinese xenophobia in particular in the current climate. They know that social tensions have reached breaking point, that there's going to be a challenge, that governments will not survive, that social antagonisms will erupt and take an explosive form, and they are seeking to mobilize people and redirect tensions away and out towards China, uh, Iran, Venezuela, immigrants, call it what you will. But I will say this, that the sentiment that exists in the working class is not that. The sentiment that he identifies in his crude, right-wing, typically filthy way, dominates in the working class. There's a feeling that capitalism has been exposed and that something more equitable, more humane must emerge. And it's our task to give that direction. And it, there's every indication that that is becoming an increasingly powerful sentiment in the working class, that it's a sentiment that will grow and provided that we provide it, uh, give it conscious expression, that our tendency will e is emerging and will emerge increasingly as a very powerful political force in the, not just the British, but the international working class. I, I agree completely. And in fact, uh, Clarkson undersells his argument because the monstrous population also went after those saints, Mike Ashley, who tried to claim that tennis shoes were essential items and bring his workforce uh, back into, into unsafe conditions. And uh, I forget the, the owner of Weatherspoons, who channeled the spirit of Marie Antoinette and told that his workers that they were all sacked and that they could at least not go and eat cake, but go and get a job at Tesco's. Um, 
and the fact is and the important point about this is that there was a strong strong reaction to this and a, a general developing sentiment that these that the masters of the universe that the billionaire class are far from being some sort of the pioneers of society and the ones who drive it forward are the parasites on it um, and as you said this is creating an explosive social sentiment that was referred to uh, in, I believe, an article in Bloomberg, which we made reference to in one of our perspectives on the World Socialist website, that this would become a trigger for social revolutions um, all over the world. And in that context, I just want to bring up because it, it raises one of the threats uh, in this situation. And then from that, I think we can get on to what our response and our program is. But the threat that's raised, we have a question that comes in that says, uh, my fear is that it seems that some measures taken under the guise of coronavirus are the very right-wing measures that have been touted by the ruling class across Europe. If in fact, these measures become the new normal and aren't reversed, closed borders, no migration, further police powers, no public gatherings or strikes, further controls and the rise of fascism in response to inadequate accommodation uh, and basic supply of healthcare and food. I mean, how, how would you respond to this as a, as a concern and how do we, as a Socialist Equality Party, respond? Anyone who's not concerned with that has um, missed, missed the narrative. I mean, these are, this is a very real threat to the working class. There is no going back from this. It's not, we're not looking at the end of a crisis in which there's a return to a normalcy, there's, there's a new normal. None of the powers which the ruling class has accrued to itself, they're, not, they're going to say, all right, now we no longer need them. They're going to use those powers against the working class. You know, the, the police, the, me the measures against social distancing, telling people to stay in their homes, will then be used to send people to work etc etc but we're not i mean i was accused uh, i did an interview this week and I was, uh, the my interviewer said well you, you're very optimistic <laughs> uh well you can't be a socialist and not be optimistic because and it's not a mood anyway it's a we base ourselves on an historically determined understanding of the role played by the uh, working class within capitalist society, a class which at the moment is exploited, but given political leadership, becomes the most powerful social force the world has ever seen. We are as aware as anyone of the dangers emanating from the ruling class. But unlike every other tendency that's written off the working class, we don't share the position that workers are gullible, stupid, that they are that they don't respond. The the fundamental problem identified by Leon Trotsky, confronting the working class, and therefore confronting humanity, was the crisis of revolutionary leadership. There's a perspective uh, crisis in the working class. All of, all of the perspectives which were championed in the past based on various forms of regulating the national economy and securing social peace have all been blown apart by the development of globalization and the descent of capitalism into an acute crisis. Something new is required, but it's not something new that needs to be invented. See, what do we represent in this situation? What does the Socialist Equality Party represent? What does the World Socialist website represent? We certainly give a voice to the sentiment that exists in the working class. You can see that in the article on Bournemouth or on the postal workers dispute or the disputes in Amazon or the innumerable interviews that have been conducted in one country after another. We turn to the working class. We seek to give that a voice, give it expression, but we do so from the standpoint also of addressing a political perspective to the working class. And there's a growing audience for it. I mean, we, you know, we, we discussed about the uh, the readership of the World Socialist website. 
and you know, just just as just a sight. Sorry about this. Should have really printed this out. Um, but the audience for our perspective is getting bigger all the time. Uh, the, uh, according to Alexa, which is the authority considered to be the authoritative account of these things, the World Socialist website is ranked 15,323rd in global internet traffic and engagement. In the UK, its ranking is 1,554th. That's an, that's an incredible situation. If you consider that... Um, We've, uh, the Labour Party's website is 207,406th in its global ranking. Jeremy Corbyn is so low in his ranking that there are no comparable stats, statistics available. Uh, Alexa ranks him as 2,420,250th. And that is a fall of half a million over the last 90 days. Our left-wing competitors, for want of a better term, uh, the Socialist Party and Socialist Workers Party, barely figure. Now, we know at, the, at this point we are a small political tendency. You know, but all of the indications are not think not simply because we're optimistic but all of the indications are that as this crisis develops they develops a growing audience for the program and perspective associated with the trotsky's movement and defended historically by the international committee and embodied in the world socialist website the socialist equality parties and our CADA. and those who are listening today who aren't members should think about that very seriously. Because if there's a recognition, for example, uh, whoever asked the question of the dangers that are pregnant within this situation, then what is the answer? If you're in danger, you prepare to, to confront that danger. And confronting that danger requires the building of a new political leadership in the working class. And that leadership is the SEP. And just following on from those obviously very important points, a viewer asks, in spite of pressure from the trades unions on workers to carry on regardless in deadly working conditions in order to safeguard the economy from total collapse, there is a growing resistance in the working class to continue working in these conditions and also resistance to the end of social isolation to a, a premature end of the public health measures uh, and a resistance to that call to return to work. How can this resistance be taken forward? Obviously, we've articulated a series of demands on the World Socialist website. We've produced a number of very important perspectives which give a lead to the sort of political response that has to be taken. Um, and we've addressed, as we've said, several key sectors of the workforce with a program uh, and with steps that can be taken to begin organizing uh, a, a movement of the working class that can can resist this danger, as you've said, perhaps as we're coming to, to our sort of closing time, you could elaborate what some of those demands are and, and how we have sought to respond to this crisis and encourage workers to do so. Yes, well, I mean, first of all, all of our demands whatever demand we place has one overarching aim, which, which is to develop the independent political activity and initiative of the working class. And we don't do that uh, by ignoring the present state of social relations. I, we, we live under capitalism. So we don't limit ourselves to um, local initiatives you know, food banks, um, helping out in the community, which are all very good and necessary under certain circumstances. But what we say is that there is an absolute conflict 
between the interests of the broad mass of the population and the existing social, uh, social and political system. There, is va there are vast amounts of money, resources, finance, everything that is required to combat COVID-19, to safeguard jobs, to de develop and extend health provision, care for the elderly, pensions, all exist within society, but it's all monopolized by the ruling class. It's, it owns the banks, it owns the corporations, it controls the governments. So we say to the working class, we put before the working class a series of demands that direct the working class to changing, challenging and changing that situation. We say, take control of essential industries, strip the wealth from the oligarchy, being production for need, not profit, a program of public works, guarantee the income of, of workers and young people for the course of this crisis. They say there's no money. There's plenty of money. They've been shoving it into the Federal Reserve in America, the Bank of England in Britain, the uh, Germany Central Bank, the European Union, Japanese banks. They've all been pushing money, endless supplies of money. Firstly, in 2008, when the global crash took place. And now on an even bigger scale, they're using society's resources to prop up the financial oligarchy and secure their grotesque levels of personal and corporate wealth. We say take that off them. Take, the, take control of society's wealth. Run industry in your, and we, we, we've formulated a series of demands which are designed to address the working class to what is required in the reconstruction of society along socialist foundations. Demands that inexorably lead to the conclusion that the working class has got to take state power and implement a socialist system. And that is, but it's never from the standpoint of simply demanding others do. We're mobilized, we're seeking the working class to become an independent political factor in political life and social life. Accompanying that, we, we make an absolute stress that you can't trust the Labour Party, you can't trust the Democratic Party, you can't trust the SPD, you can't trust Podemos, you can't trust, trust Saritza, you can trust none of these parties. You cannot rely on the trade unions. The trade unions confront the working class as a hostile force. They are instruments of corporate management in the imposition of job losses, wage cuts, speed ups. So we call for the creation of rank and file committees in the workplaces, uh, community uh, organizations that develop the independent activity of the working class. But it all centers on one central task, which is the, the construction of a new leadership in the working class, a, revolution, a revolutionary party of the international working class. You cannot develop a genuine response to any of society's problems now on a national basis. Doesn't matter whether it's the coronavirus crisis, global unemployment, the impending economic catastrophe, the growing th threat of war, environmental degradation, they all point to the need to organize on a global scale. The only class that can carry that forward and in, in, that doing, in doing so become a pole of attraction for scientists, academics, the more oppressed layers of the population, including the peasantry, is the working class because it is the only in international class with no interest in the existing system of exploitation and the division of the world into antagonistic nation states. So we advance at the center of everything we do, the perspective of world socialism, of the revolutionary seizure of power by the working class and the transformation 
of society uh, uh, along sources foundations of production of planned production for need not profit that can utilize the enormous resources of the world to meet essential the essential requirements of the billions of people on this planet and that is that type of political realignment is pregnant within this situation but it has to be fought for the, if, I, if I was going to conclude on anything we're speaking to people on this meeting I hope who are somewhat familiar with what the World Socialist website stands for and what the Socialist Equality Party represents well there are certain times when you have to take a decision to decide if you agree with the perspective that we've outlined if you understand the gravity of the situation now confronting workers in britain europe and internationally then it requires that you dedicate your life to socialism take your position within the socialist equality party fight for its resources and I want to make a special appeal, and I know that we'll probably conclude on this, to, let, to join in and attend our International May Day meeting on May the 2nd, because we will outline the global international perspective that is represented by the International Committee of the Fourth International, the World, Tr the World Trotsky's Movement, the World Party of Socialist Revolution. Thank you, Chris. And we are as you say, running up close to our two-hour cutoff mark. Obviously, this isn't the end of the discussion. Some very crucial political issues have been raised here today, which I, I know those watching will, will think long and hard on. And now we, as Chris has said, would like to let you know about some key events and ways in which you can stay in contact with the work of the Socialist Equality Party and the World Socialist website. As Chris has mentioned, in just under two weeks time, on Saturday, the 2nd of May, uh, four o'clock in the UK. Our international movement is organising and streaming a May Day rally. Speakers from all over the world, leading figures in the socialist movement, will be giving presentations on every aspect of the coronavirus pandemic and, crucially, on the struggle of the international working class for its own independent socialist response to this crisis. Any fight back against what we've characterised as the malign neglect of the world's capitalist governments and for a humane society which protects people's lives and livelihoods begins at this event. We encourage all of you to make plans to attend, uh, yourselves of course, but also to invite any friends, family members and colleagues uh, and to begin building the only movement which can offer a way out of the slaughterhouse that 21st century capitalism has become. Uh, we thank you very much for your attendance at what is uh, a first attempt at an online meeting on our part. Thank you for bearing with us. We hope it came across well. Uh, and we, as we say, encourage you to continue the discussion on the Facebook page after we're gone. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you on the Saturday after next. Thank you very much, Chris, as well. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye-bye.